welcome back to our study. Today we have the opportunity to study the character of Pilate. We've been studying various characters in the trial and in the crucifixion of Jesus through the lens of Philippians chapter 3. We've been examining their motivations and, and what puts them in contrast to the character of Jesus. Paul has intentionally done that in Philippians as he said, I want you to walk as we do following the example of Jesus. We, we see that example in Philippians 2. But he says, unfortunately, I say it with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their, their end is destruction, their, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, and their mind is on earthly things. Well, as we study the char character of Pilate, we'll discover some of those attributes true of him as well. Uh, Pilate was the governor, and, and perhaps you know this, he was the governor in Judea in the years 26 all the way to 37 AD. Uh, when it comes to his particular role as governor, you'll notice that this overlaps with that of Caiaphas, who served as the high priest. Uh, Caiaphas goes back even further. He started in 18 and goes up to 37 AD. But every year, Pilate, as the oppressing force coming from Rome, representing Rome in this region, uh, had the responsibility of appointing the high priest or reaffirming the high priest in the case of Caiaphas. So these two knew one another. Uh, Caiaphas had been reaffirmed annually over the last several years by Pilate. When it comes to Pilate's character, we know a few things about his particular role as governor over this region. He had a job that was a military role to protect the, the borderland that is Judea, uh, that is Palestine, of Rome, to protect the interests of Rome. They are an occupy, uh, occupational force. And so Pilate has a, a military component to his responsibility. Uh, Pilate also has a component of taxation that he is responsible for. He's responsible for gathering taxes and sending some of them, those back to Rome. He's responsible for maintaining the peace. And more pertinent for us today, he's responsible for governing or giving justice when something that has been a trial is brought before him. Typically, a governor like him would want to carry out these kinds of things early on in the morning. In fact, sunrise, even going a little bit later to mid-morning, but they want to be freed up by that point in the day. So it's no surprise to us that when Caiaphas and the other Jewish officials bring Jesus, it's early on in the morning. My hunch is this, is that Pilate knew they were coming. It may even be that part of the detachment of soldiers that went to arrest Jesus were sent with the awareness of Pilate going to reach them. So Pilate finds himself in this, this moment where he's caught up in something that's somewhat confusing, I'm assuming, that morning. Why have they brought this man to him and why do they want him to be crucified? But the thing about Pilate, when it comes to his particular role, is he's kind of in a precarious position when it comes to this moment in the trial of Jesus. Uh, similar to Caiaphas, uh, he has a position he wants to maintain. He has a power he wants to maintain. We could look at, at it through the lens of, is his God his stomach, his glory, his shame? Is his mind on earthly things? And we'll notice some attributes about Pilate that allow us to have insight into his motivation of why he decided what he did. You know, he did, by the way, declare Jesus as innocent. He had nothing that he could discover that would see why Jesus would be deserving of the cross. And yet, what we'll discover is Jesus is crucified nonetheless. So how did that happen? What's in the background? Well, both in the Bible as well as in uh, historical documentation, we find evidence about this character of Pilate. Let, let me give you a few examples. Josephus tells us. Josephus is a Jewish historian who later on sides with the Romans in 70 AD when the temple is destroyed, and he tells us a few things about Pilate. One is a story. It's an interesting story. Uh, most scholars think it happened early on in Pilate's reign, around 26 AD. Uh, Pilate decides, hey, this is a Roman province. What I'm going to do is at night, I'm going to bring in the Roman standard and and I'm going to bring in the Roman standards into Jerusalem, and we're going to let them know this occupational force is here, and we're going to represent it through these standards that are there. Of course, these are images. And he makes this decision from Caesarea Maritima, where he sets up his palace. It's more of a Roman city than what Jerusalem is. And as he does, the, the people in Jerusalem protest. They send the delegation back up to Caesarea Maritima. And as they're coming, Pilate tells his soldiers, hey, when they come in, if they don't relent, if they don't submit to my authority, I want you to draw your swords that you have secretly hidden 
and I, I want you to surround them. And so as the delegation comes in, Pilate has the swords drawn, but the people who are there to protest lay down on the ground and Josephus says they bare their necks because they'd rather die than the Roman standard continue to stand in Jerusalem. Well, there's one example of kind of Pilate being stuck and this dynamic that plays out politically for Pilate. How is he going to maintain his power, his position, if these kinds of things are going to happen? After all, part of his job is to maintain the peace of Rome. There's another story in Josephus where Pilate takes money out of the temple, as in the temple in Jerusalem, as in money that had been given to God. You can imagine how this went over. Uh, Pilate takes money out of the temple, but you have to know that for a Roman governor, that's actually fairly normal. Uh, you could be an Ephesus and take money out of the temple because after all, the goddess there is the benefactor of the city. And so that money could be used in benefaction to build streets and roads and aqueducts. Well, Pilate does this. He takes money out of the temple in Jerusalem and builds an aqueduct. And there's a protest and there's tension and there's... Uh, there, there's uh, conflict between these two people, between the Jewish officials and between Pilate and the Roman occupational force. We also find in the book of Luke, Jesus alludes to it. People are asking Jesus about this incident in Luke chapter 13, where Pilate apparently mixed the blood of some Galileans with their sacrifice. And honestly, I mean, this is kind of about what we know other than what we hear in Luke chapter 13. What was that exactly that happened? Is this part of why uh, Pilate and Herod which he comes up in the trial in just the next few moments, we'll mention him. Is this why they don't get along? And then after the trial of Jesus, they're friends? I don't know. But there's some tension that takes place that puts Pilate in kind of a predicament. Uh, Philo tells a story of Pilate bringing in shields. Uh, Philo is a Jewish man who lives in Alexandria, and he's writing at a later time during the reign of Caligula, and he writes about Pilate bringing Roman shields with inscriptions. This apparently is different than the Roman standards that Josephus mentions. And again, we have this protest that happens, and Pilate is actually then chastised by Rome for that action in the form of a letter. Pilate continues to find himself in kind of a precarious position. His position there as the governor of Judea continues to be at risk because of these Jewish officials. Uh, historians also talk about a, a political connection that Pilate had back in Rome, uh, that Pilate's benefactor was likely a man named Sejanus. Sejanus was a Praetorian guard who had risen in the ranks uh, during the reign of the emperor uh, Tiberius. And as the emperor Tiberius retreated to the island of Capri, Sejanus maneuvered himself around in Rome to become very popular. In fact, so popular that he was going to receive some honors by the Senate. But when Tiberius heard some of the corruption and some of the things that he had done, some of the opposition and even insurrection on behalf of Sejanus to perhaps overthrow Emperor Tiberius. Sejanus is in with the Senate and Tiberius has a letter that's read of accolades and praise, but it pivots and shifts to one of accusations. And eventually Sejanus is taken out. He's hung up, he's beaten, and his body's unrecognizable. And eventually he's thrown in the river. If this is Pilate's benefactor, the one responsible for putting Pilate into power, and if the timeline that we have is 33 AD, then this is just a year and a half. This is just after that has happened to Sejanus. And Pilate is now viewing himself as a potential target in response to that by the emperor and by everyone else who has been very intentional to align themselves with the emperor in Rome. Sejanus' family executed. In fact, his own wife wrote a letter and then killed herself. Uh, his political rival or his political friends executed, killed, they are, are sent away. And so Pilate has to view himself, if we are looking at this date being 33 AD, as a potential target in response to that. He is hanging on a thread. And so when the Jewish officials come and they bring Jesus, Jesus who is claiming to be a king, when they bring him before Pilate, Pilate has to know that he is in a very interesting moment. The question about Jesus is, is he the king? Now, Pilate has uh, really, when it comes to, is he a king? When it comes to Rome, the idea, he knows this. Jesus, Jesus answers the question, are you king? Jesus says this. He says, I'm a king, but not exactly the same kind of king you're talking about. Jesus talking about the Messiah. 
over and over again, as we look at this text, Pilate seven to 10 times is going to say, I see nothing that this man has done that is deserving of death. Seven to 10 times, the judge in this court case is going to declare him innocent. Now, I find some of these echoes intriguing as we see Pilate judging correctly. I mean, we've already seen in the last episode that Pilate judged the motivations of the Jewish officials accurately. He says, it's out of envy that you've brought him to me. He judges correctly. He just does the wrong thing because of his own motivations, because he, his God is his stomach. His glory, his desire to be on the throne is his shame. His mind is on earthly things. He, his walk is in opposition to the cross of Christ because of those very motivations. And even though he sees Jesus not as a threat to Rome, and even though over and over again he sees him as innocent, Pilate eventually will say several statements that are important for us to pay attention to. One of them is this, what is truth? Now, Jesus, just days before, just moments before, hours before, John chapter 14 said this, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Pilate knows the truth that Jesus is innocent, but he's going to close his eyes to it. But the very truth that is the truth is standing right in front of him. Pilate is going to release a man. And he's going to ask. It's one of the seven to ten ways he tries to release Jesus. He's going to ask, who would you like me to release to you, this man Jesus or this man named Barabbas? Scholars have pointed out that name. That name Barabbas is the word bar, which is son of Abbas, son of the father. <laughs> Think about the irony of this. The man who is released is the son of the father, so that the son of the father would be put on a cross. Someone is set free who is guilty, because someone who is innocent is put on a cross. Uh, the Gospels pick up on this, and we need to pay attention to it, because this is our story. This is why we walk the way that we do when we walk according to the pattern of the cross and the example we see lived out in the lives of those who follow Jesus. Pilate says this, though. He says, I wash my hands. I wash my hands of him. He's yours. And he says, here's the king of the Jews, and they say, we have no king but Caesar. They make the accusation, they make the indictment on themselves. We have no king. My question for us is this question, who's your king? Jesus calls us to follow him as our king. Pilate, in response, washes his hands to Jesus. And I find it ironic that Pilate washes his hands so that an innocent man could die. But the innocent man dies so that we could wash far more than our hands. You see, as we look to the cross of Jesus, we find a king worth following. And so Pilate would hand him over to a cohort of soldiers. The cohort is usually around 600 men. And they would mock him as a king. They would put a crown of thorns on his head. They would take a staff, a stick, and they would hit him with it. The symbol of power and his authority, they would take and they would mock him with it and beat him with it to show he had no authority there. They would put a cloak, apparently an old garment, perhaps a military garment over Jesus, and they would mock him. They would kneel down to him and they would bow down to him and, and, and say, in kind of an echo to what they would typically say to the emperor, hail the king of the Jews. But ironically, the cross of Jesus in some ways was an inauguration. This mock king game that they were playing was actually this moment where we realized that Jesus is the king we've been needing all along. A king un unlike Pilate, who won't wash his hands of our mess and, and won't turn away to injustice. But Paul says he's both just and the justifier. He is the one who washes our sins. He is the one who is truth. He is the one who, what Paul says, comes down from the throne, steps away from the throne and steps toward a cross so that we could spend eternity with him. He's the kind of Messiah we need. Paul, throughout the book of Philippians says, walk according to this pattern. Do everything without selfish ambition. Consider everything rubbish compared to the value that we have and what we find in knowing Jesus. Paul says over and over again that Jesus is worth mimicking and following. So here's what we've done. 
We've studied thus far the characters of Judas, of Caiaphas, and now of Pilate. In our last, last episode, what we want to do is we want to turn and we want to look at the character of Peter. Because what we notice with Peter is he has some of these moments in him that cause him to deny Jesus. But he turns and he has an opportunity to repent and to be restored. And Peter will go out, as we'll discover, and he will follow and walk like Jesus. We find this over and over again, that we have the opportunity to be washed. We have the opportunity, like Barabbas, to be set free because someone has died in our place.